Choir, thanks for getting us off on the right foot, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Spanish Rails Gospel Chapel, where the word of, God, word of God goes forth, proclaiming the wonderful love of Jesus, how he sacrificed himself there on the cross. This service is convened every Sunday night, so souls could have another opportunity, uh, opportunity to be a part of the family of God, and that's our prayer and desire tonight that someone will turn to Christ. Let's pr continue to praise the Lord by singing number 439. It says, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. Don't never be afraid to tell Jesus that you love him. It's all about him and what he's done for us. But we were created for his pleasure. I don't know why we were created, created for his pleasure, because we fail him so much. But he loves to hear a child of God when they're obedient to him truly say, I love you, Lord Jesus. So let's stand and sing this to the praise, honor, and glory of his name.
praise be his name. Let us look to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence, in and through the worthy and precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Tonight, Lord, we want him to be lifted up. We know when he's lifted up, men will be drawn unto him. So, Lord, let us be just put away. Self be put away. Pride be put away. And just let the Spirit of God just come in our midst tonight and move. Everything that is sung, everything said, Lord, may it bring praise, honor, and glory to your dear and wonderful name. Lord, we want to see Jesus lifted up tonight. We want to see souls being brought into the kingdom of God. We have a, Lord, your word is told for tonight. Throughout this island, throughout the Bahamas, the Bahamas needs the Lord. People need the Lord everywhere around us. Let us, as Christians, be burdened, be able to see men clearly that they're walking about in this earth, lost. So let us be concerned. Let our light shine before men that they may see our good works that we do in Christ, that they may see Jesus in us. Lord, this is what we've been hearing over the past few weeks. Lord, is it being a reality in my life? Is it be a, being a reality in our lives? Lord, we know the day of grace is fast coming to a close. Our loved ones, our friends, they're still outside the hawk of safety. They need Jesus. So, Lord, we just pray, even tonight, as our brother speaks the word, that your spirit will take it and use it for your praise, for your honor, and for your glory. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to be blessed and uh, and. Two solos, we're going to have a piano soloist first, higher ground, and then a soloist coming, Take Me to the Cross.
dressed up in her Sunday clothes as he held her hand on bended knee. He said, I need to show you how to find your way home. As they walked along, how sweet the sound. Church bells ring and people gathered round. Said, remember this church and the crossway up there, sweetheart. If you ever get lost, say, take me to the cross. High upon the steeple, the one where Jesus died for all the lost people. If you can't find home, no, you're not alone. As the years went by, Daddy's little girl lost herself out in a great big world. Then on the day that her daddy died, she said, I need to know why, so take me to that cross high upon the steeple, the one where Jesus for hurting people if you can't find home no you're not alone take me to the cross now that same little girl 30 years gone by she still knows her daddy's by her side she raises her little boy in her father's way and she smiles when she hears her son say hey mom take me to that cross High upon the steeple, the one where Jesus died for all the lost people. If you can't find home, no, you're not alone. Remember the cross, high upon the steeple, the one where Jesus died for hurting people. If you can't find home, no, you're not alone. Take me to the cross. Just take me to the cross. Take me to the cross. Amen. Thank you, Adam and Nina. Hallelujah. That's sing number 611. The Lord gave me this today, and now I know why. Stand as we sing.
choir is coming now with the last selection. Beautiful one. And then right after the choir is done, Brother Randy Amos, we're glad to have you here. You come right up when the choir comes down and share with us what the Lord has on your heart. Nice to be back with a Bible to proclaim the Word of God and the name and message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now tonight as we begin, we're, we're basing our thoughts at least in the first couple weeks, Lord willing, on the book of Isaiah. And even in the gospel tonight, we'll find ourselves there. But to kind of introduce ourselves to where we're headed tonight, let's start out in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 1, please. The book of 1 Peter and chapter 1. First Peter, chapter 1. The born-again Christians are being reminded here as we go down to verse 9. First Peter 1 and uh, verse 9 from the Word of God. Verse 9, Receiving the end of your faith, 
even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister to things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. And God will bless the reading of his word. Well, tonight in this little section, brothers and sisters and friends, you saw the subject of salvation, didn't you? In verse 9, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10 reminded us that the Old Testament prophets wrote of this salvation. They prophesied of it. And then going to verse 11, we saw how they wrote. Look at verse 11 again. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did test signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. In advance, God put His Spirit in these Old Testament prophets, and they had two main themes to their subject of salvation. And those two main themes are in verse 11. Number one, the sufferings of Christ, or the sufferings of Messiah. But number two, the glory that should follow. There's a double message here. There is a Messiah, a Savior, who will suffer, and there's one who will rule and reign in glory the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. As these men, like Isaiah and other prophets, wrote these prophecies through the Spirit of Christ, they didn't always understand what they were writing or when it would even happen. Looking at verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister to things which are now reported unto you by them, and so on. They didn't know what in verse 11, they didn't know what manner of time, and they really weren't writing it for themselves, per se, as for a future generation. And so when we come to this great subject of salvation, there are two major parts to it, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. As we will see in our study tonight, the sufferings of Christ will have to do with an aspect of salvation that we will term personal salvation or spiritual salvation where we as an individual need saved. But because there's a glory that should follow, there's also what we can term political salvation. That is when God will save his people from the tyranny of the world and the oppressor that says you can't serve God, will persecute you, and you're under our control when the kingdom of God comes. There is this aspect of personal salvation where I need saved from my sins and judgment, and there is an aspect of political salvation where, where the, uh, the world needs saved from political tyranny and that they're free to serve God. And God will accomplish both in Christ, in the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. J just like if you would have a coin in your pocket and there's two sides to it to make one coin. There's heads and there's tails, and both sides make one coin. And in the salvation of God, it requires the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. For he promises not only personal salvation, he does promise political salvation. And he claims the prophets wrote about it. So let's go to one of those prophets we're looking at, the prophet Isaiah. And let's go to Isaiah chapter 12, please. Isaiah chapter 12. As we get there, you will see the subject is salvation. In fact, Isaiah wrote about, more about salvation than any other Old Testament prophet. Looking here at Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2. Isaiah 12 and verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Verse 3. Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. In fact, Isaiah means God is salvation. And so bringing us to the subject of the God, not man, God is my salvation. But when Isaiah presents it, 
He will do it just like Peter said he would do it by the Spirit of Christ. He'll speak of the sufferings of Christ, which will be personal salvation. He'll speak of a glorious Messiah returning, the glory that should follow, which will accomplish political salvation. Now, first of all, I'd like to show you an example in Isaiah of both personal salvation and political salvation, so we kind of understand what God means here. So, so let's go to Isaiah chapter 37 to see an, uh, an example of two stories of salvation. One in chapter 37 of Isaiah, and the next one will be in the very next chapter of 38. But of course, starting with 37 first, it will involve King Hezekiah, who was uh, Jerusalem's king of the line of David, the people of God, and in those days they were kind of weak, and there was a king by the name of Sennacherib from the great Assyrian Empire, and he was in the middle of conquering the world. And he was defeating one nation after another, one city after another, and found himself, his emissaries anyway, at the doorstep of Jerusalem, the city of God. And now breathing out intimidation and threatenings, you're next to fall, we'll conquer you and your God also. And so you can't serve God, you can't worship Him, you'll be under us. Now we're going to break in on that in Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 10 when his emissary says this to Hezekiah the king in chapter 37 of Isaiah and verse 10. Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't let him give you a pep talk and saying, you know, we'll overcome. Jerusalem won't fall, that city of God. It will, it's he says anyway. Verse 11, Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan, Haran, Arespa, the children of Eden, uh, which were in Taliasar? Where is the king of Hamath? and the king of Arphad, and the king of the city of Seraphim, Hena and Iva. We're undefeated. Where's these other kings and their gods? We conquer them. What makes you think since we're undefeated, you're going to survive us? This great intimidation to the people of God, political tyranny that you're going to be under us. What does Hezekiah do? He turns to God. He doesn't turn to man and marshal up his army. He turns to God. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying. So he goes before the living Lord, and he sort of reads that letter to God, and here's what they're saying about you. And he asked for something. And look what he asked for in verse 20. Verse 20 of Isaiah 37. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us not from hell, <laughs> save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. And here you see an example of political salvation. Save us from the world's tyranny, the world's evil. Uh, give us military victory. Uh, make it better for us. Save us from his hand, asking for political salvation. And God answers that prayer, and against all kind of odds, gives it to him. Look at part of God's answer through Isaiah in verse 35 of chapter 37. Verse 35. Isaiah 37 and verse 35, the Lord says this, For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Not save a soul from hell and sin and guilt, to save a city so my people can be free to serve me. I will save it. That's political salvation. And God does it without any human works in this case. Look what he does in verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. One angel wipes out 185,000 trained troops. That's about three times the size of a Miami football stadium. Uh, just one angel. And God granted political freedom 
from the tyranny of the enemy, an example of political salvation. And that is part of the message that God offers in Christ. Someday this world will be free from all its evil and all its tyranny, free to love and serve God without any hindrances. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the Lord Jesus taught in Matthew 6 and verse 10. And so this is the glory that should follow. But when you get to chapter 38, and Hezekiah will be praying again, it will be for personal salvation. Let's look at that other aspect in Isaiah 38 now, and if you look at verse 1. Isaiah 38 and verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now it's not your city going to be destroyed by the Assyrians. You're headed for death. And so he's headed for that consequence of death. You'll die and not live. What does he do? He goes to the Lord again. Look at verse 2. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. And so, Lord, remember now, O Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore, Let, lays it before the Lord. God sends Isaiah the prophet back with a message. God plans to recover you and extend your life so you will not immediately die. Hezekiah, in recounting that, look, look at verse 16 now, what he says. Isaiah 38 and verse 16. O Lord, by these things men live, and all these things is the life of my spirit, so wilt thou recover me and make me to live. Not recover the city from political oppression. Recover me, save me. But look at verse 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul, delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. You loved my soul. Whatever sins I had while you were cutting me short, you put them out of sight. You dealt with my sins in love. Look what he says in verse 20. Verse 20, Isaiah 38. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Not save the city, but save me. And so now we come to God's salvation, this great message of the prophets fulfilled in Christ, and it involves political salvation. There's freedom of a new world coming, thank the Lord. But it also involves personal salvation where the world doesn't need punish and I need freed from the world. I deserve to be punished and I need freed from my sins and the judgment of my sin. Political salvation and personal salvation. You know, when John the Baptist was about to be born, the Spirit of God came upon his father in Luke chapter 1 and prophesied the era, the messianic era that was about to come in which John the Baptist would introduce Jesus, Messiah, the Savior. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he talked about both aspects of salvation. You know, in Luke 1, 71, Zechariah prophesied through the Spirit that we should be saved, not from hell, from our enemies and from the hand of them that hate us. Went on to say that we might serve the Lord without fear. Saved from the Romans, and we have no fear. We can raise our children. Nobody can say, you can't do this and, and tempt you with evil. Political salvation is part of the coming Messiah. But also, Zechariah prophesied in Luke 1, that uh, by the knowledge of him, he shall give remission of sins to his people. And so... There's the remission of our personal sins, but also saved from our enemies. And they both revolve around the same person, Lord Jesus Christ, in two great acts, the sufferings of Christ, which happened first, and the glory that should follow. You know, Israel in our Lord's day only picked up a half of the message. They picked up the glory that should follow. They picked up a reigning Messiah that would crush the Romans and give them political freedom as Jews to worship God without fear. But they never thought of a suffering Messiah that was so weak he, couldn't, he wouldn't come down from the cross, bleeding and massacred up there. And they said, if he's the Son of God, let him come down from the cross. And so they only believed half the message and never saw their need for personal salvation. Oh, the Gentiles, government needs reformed and judged. 
but how about us personally? And so there's two sides to this. As you look at Isaiah, it will present the Messiah, the Christ, and it will present him in two portraits. It will present a suffering, weak Messiah, and it will present a mighty warrior crushing the Lord, or crushing the world. And it will be the same person, the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. God first seeing our need for personal salvation as sinners and then seeing our, the need for world deliverance to serve God and to love God. Thy kingdom come. Let's look at those two portraits. We've seen the two concepts of personal salvation and political salvation, but let's see in the Messiah that both events are speaking of the same person. So let's go to that famous section, Isaiah 53, please. Isaiah chapter 53. Maybe just to connect it, uh, just glance a little bit before to chapter 52, please. And look what the Lord says in verse 13, 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall be deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Exaltation, glory. But before that would happen, look at the next verse, verse 14. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Oh, before this exaltation, you're not going to recognize him as a human. They would tear his beard from the cheeks, the prophet said. His visage, his form, more than the sons of men. It goes on to speak in chapter 53 of a rejected Messiah, one who suffered, but suffered uh, for our sins, to save us. Not to change the world yet, but to save us. Look, look how it presents to him in verse 3. That's Isaiah 53, and for example, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Here's a man of sorrows, rejected by men. We don't want him. Away with him. Crucify him. It's no mighty warrior crushing the armies with just the help of one angel, 185,000 troops. Never mind the whole world when he comes back. This is somebody being crushed himself. Uh, look at verse 5. It's not judgment falling on the corrupt governments. It's judgment falling on the Son of God. Look at verse 5 and why. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or punishment of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Can it be? Judgment falling not on corrupt governments, judgment falling on God's servant in whom his soul delights, his beloved son, the Lord Jesus. Not for his own sins, for our transgressions. Crushed, look at verse 10, Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Some of you have crushed him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So often we say, well, this world needs change, and, and we need heaven, and all. Yeah, but first we need saved. Oh, there is glory that should follow. But first of all, I have to see that I'm the sinner, and Isaiah will present that also. In Isaiah 59, for example, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. He said, like, where's his power in my life? He doesn't seem to listen. I wonder if he's dead. No, no. Your iniquities has separated you between you and your God. And your sins has hid his face from you that he will not hear. A holy God, there's that barrier of sin that keeps him out. But God in love sent his son and did not put the judgment on you or the ungodly nations. Put it on him. He became that perfect sacrifice. And in the language of 1 Peter 2.24, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. You see, before we say, well, this world needs change, we need better government, we have to see we need saved. We need to cry out in the language of Acts 16.30 where the man cried out, what must I do to be saved? Not How do we change this world? How can government get better? I'm the problem also. 
as the man said in Luke 18, 13, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Have you ever taken your place as a guilty sinner, not just criticize the church and government and say, yeah, we need a better kingdom? Uh, I, I'm headed for judgment. I'm headed for hell in the lake of fire. I, uh, I have my sins. I need saved. And God will point you not to a church, not to a self-help program, not, not, not to just walking better. He'll point you to a Messiah, the sufferings of Christ, who there, the sinless one, bore your sin, was an acceptable sacrifice that we could never be. And in the language of 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What must I do to be saved? A suffering Messiah. And when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, is the promise of Acts 16.31. Personally saved from the wrath of God, uh, justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, Romans 5.9. Huh? Personally escaping all that we deserve because Christ bore it. But as wonderful as that is, there is a glory that should follow. And Isaiah will not only present a suffering Messiah, he'll present a different portrait of a mighty warrior coming back to crush the world and its evil so God's people can be free to serve him. So let's leave the portrait of a suffering Messiah and go to a mighty warrior in the same book. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. Let's move to 63 rather than 53. Isaiah chapter 63, please. Now look at this portrait by the Spirit of God in verse 1. Isaiah 63 in verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Uh, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Who's this one that has glorious apparel? I mean, it's not humble clothes. Uh, it's glorious apparel, and, and they're dyed. We're going to see their, what they're dyed with in a minute. And who is this glorious warrior? He's mighty to save. That has crushed the world and delivers from all the evil of the world and governments and so on. Well, look at verse 2. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the winepress? Your glorious garments are all red, like you've just gone through the, a wine press. They're stained, but it's not with wine. It's with human blood. Look, look at the next verse, verse 3. I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Just like somebody crushing grapes, this mighty warrior will come back and crush all the unrepentant people and nations, and his glorious garments will be stained with blood and putting down evil. And, and no one will help him. This, too, is a gospel without works. Just like the remission of your sins is not by works, Ephesians 2.8. So the changing of this world does not involve your political works. It is that he will do it alone, this mighty warrior, this Savior. Look, look at verse 4, 63.4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered, there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. Look at verse 8. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior, God crushing the enemy. In this glory that should follow, which is nothing less than the return again in glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Described in Revelation 19, coming back to make war, a sword coming out of his mouth. Uh, and with it, he'll smite the nations. And all this evil that tempts you and all the oppressions of Christians everywhere. Uh, they'll be delivered from this into the kingdom of God. There's a mighty warrior. There's a glory that should follow. You know, Isaiah tells us about that, why this world's going to be punished. Listen to Isaiah 13, 11. He gives you the reason why. Here we see how and who, but the why is in verses like Isaiah 13, 11. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. There's a day coming when God will no longer offer salvation in the sense he is now, but there's a worldwide day of judgment coming 
Listen to Isaiah 34, 2 and 3. He said, The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out. Stink shall rise from their carcasses. Mountains shall be melted with the blood. The earth will have a stench to it. Mountains slushy with blood. And then eventually the whole earth shakes with the greatest earthquake ever, uh, says Isaiah 24. Every mountain will disappear. Every island will disappear. It's not good news for the Bahamas, I understand. But this is the day of God's wrath coming. And this mighty warrior crushing evil to bring in the righteous kingdom of God. The prophets wrote about it, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You know, as we've said, there's some, just like the Jews of that day, that only believed half the message. They believed in a glorious Messiah. And when a weak, suffering Messiah, though crucified through weakness, came, they said, he can't be the Messiah. You know, when I was in Israel, I was trying to witness to a Jewish shop owner, and I was telling him about the Lord Jesus, and he, he almost spit in my face. He said, what do you mean he's Messiah? Look around. Look at the Arabs and the Islamic people. We're, we're not free. Messiah would free us. How could you ever say he's the Messiah? I tried to tell him this half, but he couldn't see it. First, I have a word for Christians here tonight. Don't make the same mistake they did, only in reverse. Oh, we believe in one who saves us from our sins. It's not by works. But somehow we fret as we see this world. We've got to change it somehow. He'll do that too. He's coming again. And with the sword out of his mouth, he will crush the nations. He's the Savior. As Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. None will help them. We have the promise of a, the kingdom of God is coming, the glory that should follow. So how can this be the same person? One chapter shows us a suffering Messiah. Another shows us a glorious, mighty warrior. One that dies, but one that's reigning. And the suffering happens first, and the glorious one later. And what the prophets couldn't see was the time it would happen. That between these two events, there's at least 2,000 years. At least so far. You know, I live out in Oregon. We live out in Oregon now, my wife and I. And there's huge mountains. If you ever get out there, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier. And on a clear day, we can see four or five of them if we have a clear day. And driving, they'll look about 10 miles apart. You say, hey, I'll get the one, I'll get to the other. And you get there, and they're so huge. They're about 150 miles apart. And there's this great gap, but they, 2,000 years apart, these two events so far, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. But it's the same person. So let's, be, let's close with where we began and go back to 1 Peter 1. Let's go back to 1 Peter 1, please. Where it talked about the sufferings of Messiah that the prophets talked about and the glory that should follow, but reading further in 1 Peter 1, we'll see how it happens. Looking here at verse 19, speaking of the redemption of our sins. Look at verse 18, I should say. 1 Peter 1, no, make it verse 19. 1 Peter 1 and verse 19. Speaking of redemption, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There's your suffering Christ. In love, wounded for your transgressions. Taking our punishment, not falling on you or the nations, falling on God's beloved Son. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. But look what it goes on to say. Verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Verse 21. Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And thou, that's how it's the same person. The Jesus who died by resurrection is alive. And he's raised up and he's coming back in glory. I will come again. And resurrection puts the two together. Death ended him, but resurrection brought him into glory. He's coming back in full glory to crush the world and establish the kingdom of God. He died, and he rose again. It's the same person, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so tonight, say, I want the kingdom to come. Well, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3. You've got to be ready for the kingdom. And before you want to see this world change, and the Bible will teach that judgment's coming not because of climate change, because men won't change. They won't repent of their sins. 
It's not environmental pollution, it's moral pollution, it says, like sexual sin and, and murder and stealing and dishonesty. That, that's in Revelation chapter 9. And they won't repent, God says, and of their false worship. It's not environmental pollution that's going to end this planet. It's moral pollution, that's what he said. And, and they won't repent, but if we, de we repent and we confess and say, what must I do to be saved? We can be ready for the kingdom of God. And because he's risen from the dead, there is a glory that should follow. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And so tonight, let's not make the mistake that Israel did and just look, well, I can't wait till there's a better world. You're not going to get in if you're not saved. <laughs> you have to be saved. Personal salvation. Save me as God heard those words from your heart. If you cry out in repentance tonight and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, again, I close with this promise. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And God can't lie. Let's ask God to bless his word. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we just marvel at this great salvation around thy beloved Son, the Christ, the Messiah. A salvation that does save from judgment, but more than that, it will save from this world and give us a new world, accomplished through the death and resurrection of the Savior, the Lord Jesus, the, the sufferings of Christ, glory that should follow. We pray that everyone here will have both of those understood, that we as a church just won't glory in the sufferings, but realize that, and think we have to fix the world. He'll do that too. He's the Savior. And there'll be some here tonight if they're not saved, and they'll realize it must start with them. What must I do to be saved? That their sins have separated them. They need this to trust the Christ who died for them, and their hearts will turn and call on the Lord Jesus tonight and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then they'll be ready for the kingdom of God, and there will be one because of the glory that shall follow. We thank thee for this wondrous message in our Lord Jesus Christ and ask thee to work in hearts tonight for thy glory, in the Savior's name on thy right hand, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.